Okay, I'm gonna time it with uh um, before we get started, if everyone could have and, uh except the council member. They're, uh... Modesto, I'm having trouble hearing you. So I don't know if it's just me or I'm in now with channel 64 to get Prince, we are now live. Good afternoon, everyone. This is the Committee of Public Safety for City Council. Um, and we are um, about to uh, enter our hearing. Um, and Samantha Williams, will you please cite the name and number of this uh, ordinance? Sure. Today we'll be hearing bill number 210635, an ordinance amending Title 12 of the Philadelphia Code and Title Traffic Code to require the maintenance and reporting of certain information related to vehicle stops and making certain technical changes all under certain terms and conditions. And Bill Number 210636, an ordinance amending Title 12 of the Philadelphia Code and Title Traffic Code, to clarify the appropriate methods and circumstances of enforcement of traffic violations in order to provide for the fair and transparent administration of the traffic violations, prevent racial disparities, and protect public safety and making certain technical changes all under certain terms and conditions. Based on us having a, a virtual hearing there's an important message that Ms. Samantha Williams Esquire must read officially to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I understand that state law currently requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote public hearing as follows. Due to the current public health emergency, city council committees are meeting remotely. We're using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at public hearings of city council committees are included in the public hearing notices that are published in the Daily News, Inquirer, and Legal Intelligence prior to the hearing and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. Everyone who has been invited to the meeting today to testify should be aware that this public hearing is being recorded. Because the hearing is being recorded and public, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy by continuing to be in this meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Additionally, prior to Councilman Jones recognizing members for question or comments they may have for the witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that we will use the chat feature available in Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for this purpose. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Williams. So let's establish a roll call so we can officially convene this hearing. Council Member Thomas? Aye. Council Member Green? I am present looking forward to today's conversation. Council Member Gaudier? Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Samantha and colleagues present. Good afternoon. Council Member Ginn. Good afternoon, uh, Council Chair. It's wonderful to see you um, and appreciate all that you do. Good afternoon, colleagues, and I look forward to this hearing. Council Member Brooks. Vice Chairman Johnson. Present. And Chairman Jones? Present. And uh, the Committee on Public Safety has established a quorum. Um, and I'd like to, at this point, recognize the author of this legislation um, to set the tone for these hearings. Member Thomas? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I would like to start by thanking you and your entire team uh, for uh, your support throughout the course of this process, uh, specifically leading up to this hearing today. I know it was a very uh, tedious process under um, unwarranted circumstances, so we appreciate your due diligence 
and we appreciate your support. We appreciate your co-sponsorship. Um, and I appreciate the co-sponsorship of all of my colleagues, Council Members Johnson, uh, Council Member Gilmore Richardson, Council Member Gaudier, Council Member Brooks, Council Member Keone Sanchez, Council Member Parker, of course, um, our chair, Council Member Jones, and Council Member Dom. Uh, today, uh, we are here to talk about uh, an important bill that was the process of a coalition of people coming together, of stakeholders who really care about uh, what we know to be a civil rights I issue here in the city of Philadelphia. And uh, I also want to take some time to thank uh, the folks at the Defenders Association, uh, Kate, Mike, Mike, Paula, and uh, Connor. Um, I would also like to thank uh, the police officers, commit, uh, specifically Commissioner Outlaw, as well as Fran and the entire team that participated in the nego negotiations process throughout the course of this process. Uh, we appreciate the managing director's office and their support, as well as uh, Power, Mark Tyler, uh, the district attorney's office, and Reverend Holston, specifically uh, my council colleagues who I talked about earlier, um, the Inquirer in the USA Today for endorsing this bill. And last but not least, uh, somebody who uh, personally means a lot to me, and somebody who uh, planted this seed with me a long time ago, somebody who um, serves as a mentor and somebody who I call uh, the mother of the modern day criminal justice reform movement we see um, here in the city of Philadelphia, someone who I know has worked closely with the chair as well and um, has been the advocate and the Ella Baker of a lot of different um, things that we've seen in the city of Philadelphia as it relates to change and reform. And that's um, our former chief public defender, uh, Kira Bradford Gary. Um, so today we are here to look at a bill that will put us in a position where we would uh, look at eight uh, specific uh, motor vehicle code violations that would not um, have a direct impact on public safety. I look forward to talking in depth about this um, later on throughout the course of our hearing. But I know that there's been a lot of dialogue around this legislation. We know that we have a, a number of incidents in the city of Philadelphia involving crime, involving gun violence, and uh, this council body has uh, done um, what I feel like is Omen's work, uh, trying to put ourselves in a position to be able to, to combat some of the gun violence we see. And by no means would this bill be a step in the opposite direction. Uh, some of the things that we're talking about in this legislation um, are not things that in public, uh, impact the public safety. So let me give you examples of things that I know folks are worried about. Uh, we've received questions around 10 and tenant windows. This this legislation will not impact tenant windows. This legislation will not impact people speeding. This legislation will not impact someone uh, running a stop sign or turning left where they're not supposed to be turning left. Anything that would be considered a public safety hazard, um, this legislation would not impact that. It would only impact things that, that we consider not public safety hazards that speaks to more or less um, the condition of the vehicle or which often um, is uh, neglect uh, by different um, uh, drivers across the city of Philadelphia that we feel like uh, can put us in a position where not only law enforcement would have a little less responsibility, uh, but also put us in a position where hopefully we can save a few bucks as it relates to uh, some of the dollars that we spend on an annual basis because civil rights, um, um, because folks' civil rights have been violated and that then turns into lawsuits. So I look forward uh, to, the, to the dialogue here today. Um, I'm excited about the panelists who are here to testify, and I hope that we can provide the public with some clarity um, as it relates to um, the content of this legislation and the positive impact that we anticipated having on the constituents here in the city of Philadelphia. Again, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the uh, opportunity to frame the conversation, and I look forward to today's hearing. Member Thomas, we thank you for focusing on this um, issue that impacts so many. Um, in reflecting as a young man, first car, I, I know what it feels like to be pulled over uh, and not for any reason other than the fact that I was in the wrong part of, of, of town. And um, what comes next often um, is something that can scar you for a lifetime. And in certain communities, it is renowned that fathers, mothers, have to give their sons and daughters the talk. And that 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 is a that is a generational kind of talk that um, rivals the birds and the bees. Um, you, you know, you're supposed to give your kids the birds and the bees talk, but you shouldn't have to uh, give the talk on how to survive a traffic stop. 
And so I look forward to the discussion. It is, it is a delicate balance as to not having over-policing versus the proper protections we need uh, from individuals and vehicles that would do us harm. And I'm proud of your maturity to try to navigate through those two very important issues. So thank you, Member Thomas. So with that, um, Ms. Williams, can you read the first panel that is going to, are there any other council members that would like to comment on this legislation first? I wanted to comment, Mr. Chair, if that's okay. Madam, go, um, member, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start by thanking um, my colleague Isaiah Thomas, um, and I also wanted to note the importance of the legislation that you know that he's put before us. Um, knowing that less than five percent of all the vehicle stops in our city from January 2020 to March of 2021 actually resulted in the recovery of a weapon, and that the overwhelming majority of the individuals stopped by the police for alleged code violations are black um, it's very troubling to me to think about how black Philadelphians have borne the brunt of the scrutiny imposed by a very um, ineffective practice and so the legislation proposed by Councilmember Thomas um, is of the utmost importance because the situation demands that we examine the potential for racial bias in the practices of our city's police force and that we root out that bias um, wherever we find it so so um, wanted to just commend him for his efforts and his hard work. Um, I also wanted to commend former Chief Defender Keir Bradford Gray for her leadership on this initiative and a host of others, um, and Commissioner Outlaw and the Police Department for their participation um, in the collaborative process that has surrounded this legislation. And I also just wanted to say that this is legislation that you know, makes me feel, um, as a mother of a young black man who just started driving, it makes me feel that he will be safer. Um, and, and, and so it means a lot to me from a personal perspective too. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kali. Thank you. Are any other members uh, interested in putting their comments early in the hearing? Is that you, uh, Member Green? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd also like to thank um, Councilmember Thomas for his work on this bill. Uh, we've had various conversations and he has put in the work um, on this legislation and the work product shows in reference to um, this bill that's been introduced based on the work and the collaborative process he's had with law enforcement, the administration, uh, other members of council to get to this point. And I think uh, as, as you as well as Councilmember Gautier also mentioned in your comments, that you know, the vast majority of these stops are, are not being used uh, for what they should be used for and, and are used from a pretextual perspective and people are being stopped just based on, um, I would say, a, a person's skin color and a person's background where people from other communities are not getting stopped in the same way. And also based on the fact that even with these stops, there's a small number of actual tickets being issued. So it also sends another message in reference to this issue. And as we continue to work through the issues of just tr of trying to provide public safety in our city, which all constituents are trying to achieve, but at the same point, the balance of not discriminating against those um, who have a different um, skin color, um, we need to make sure we continue that balance. And I think this legislation um, does that type of approach by providing the data and the information that shows uh, what happens in these type of situations, but still allows us to continue to move forward with the public safety efforts that we're trying to achieve in our city to keep all um, citizens safe. And as a African-American man, we've all had situations where we have had uh, stops because both like council member um, Jones and council member Thomas, as well as council member Johnson, although we have you know, various titles, when we step out of city hall, um, we are an African-American man who has been approached or stopped, and I've even been profiled while leaving the district attorney's office. Uh, and so when I think about what Councilman Gautier said in reference to her son, and we have all had um, family members, uh, and for me having a child on the autism spectrum, that I really can't have that type of talk with him 
um, because of the nature of his learning difference. It makes this type of legislation and other legislation like the chair has done as well as Councilmember Johnson so very important to move forward. On. We having trouble? Member Johnson, please continue. I just want to take a moment also to acknowledge the hard work of Councilman Isaiah Thomas and making sure that we strike a balance as it relates to public safety here in the city of Philadelphia. And this is one of those pieces of legislation that's you know, obviously personal to all of us, particularly African-American men, because it's kind of sad that um, the reactions that we have when officers pull behind us uh, when we are driving um, is um, innate when it ter in terms of our response of possibly being um, pulled over and put put into a situation that could escalate. Um, and, and the sad part of, that I recognize is growing up um, in South Philadelphia and in, in, in the city of Philadelphia as a whole is just that a lot of normalized behavior that I grew up under, um, being a young guy out in the streets, um, in terms of how uh, we are treated by law enforcement officials aren't really um, abnormal. And so um, this type of legislation kind of clarifies how uh, everyone's rights should be protected and nobody should be um, racially profiled while driving while black. And so um, thank you, Councilman Isaiah Simon, for your hard work and your dedication. Thank you, Carly. I appreciate you. Member Gaudier, did you want to be recognized again or was that the first... No. Are there any other members? Member Gim? Yes, I had a very brief comment um, as well. Just again, acknowledging the hard work of the bill's sponsor, um, Council Member Thomas, um, and all the work that I know he and his team have put forward on this. But the reality is also not just that these are anecdotal experiences that come out of communities, um, but that there is actual significant. Uh, you know, indications that there's purposeful actions on behalf of our institutional city bodies. And um, I think that will come forward through the course of this hearing. It's all the more reason why we need to take formal action. Um, and I commend uh, my council colleague for making that clear. Um, you know, we are not always privy to direct conversations or memos that flow back and forth um, about how laws are interpreted and enforced. And when a number of those uh, communications came forward through a, um, you know, through uh, trial documents and other types of things that relate directly to the constitutional rights of Philadelphians and in particular black Philadelphians and Philadelphians in specific neighborhoods of this city. Um, we have to take this as seriously as possible, and it is uh, our responsibility to ensure that our city laws exist um, to not just um, reiterate protections, but to redefine them, reassert them, and then to make them clear. And I just really want to thank my colleagues on this body, um, you know, one of my favorite committees uh, in city council um, for consistently bold and creative and important work on defending the constitutional rights of all Philadelphians, um, and especially those who are most impacted by, uh, by, by individuals who, who are not following the guidelines. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. I believe that's everyone that wished to comment. If not, let me know. And with that, we will move. Ms. Williams, will you please read the names of the first panel to testify? Uh, we are going to call Mayor Daniel Biss first. Um, before the mayor testifies, I would ask that anyone who is not a council member or not testifying, please turn off your camera until your name is called. And Mayor Biss? Uh, Mayor Biss, yes. welcome. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Jones, and uh, to the committee. Uh, I want to send a special thank you to Member Thomas for uh, not only asking me to be here today, but for the partnership that he and his team have um, shown us uh, as we've tried to really learn from your work. My name is Daniel Biss. I'm the mayor of the city of Evanston. We're a town of 78,000 people just north of Chicago. And uh, obviously a community of this size doesn't have the uh, resources and sophistication of a great city like Philadelphia, but we have strong interest in reimagining the way that we provide for public safety to ensure that we're providing true shared safety for all and not just not just security for, for a few. Um, and, you know, look, we're we're proud of a, a well-intentioned police force here that's committed to trying to do the right thing. And yet, when we look at our data, we find uh, extraordinary and chilling racial disparities in our traffic stop data, not to mention our use of force data. Of course, much of that arises from, uh, from traffic stops that, in fact, turn out to have been unnecessary. And so we are trying to employ a community-wide data-driven effort to, to figure out a way to improve these practices. And, you know, given the size of our community, I've been trying to look around the country and find models, uh, not only models of policy outcomes, but models of analysis and study and process that uh, we can emulate. And, and uh, what you are uh, leading the way with in Philadelphia has been really important for us, important for us to learn from, important for us to emulate. Uh, Councilmember Thomas himself has been generous with his time, as has his team. Uh, and I, I just uh, wanted to, to share that, to, to share my appreciation and, and make sure that, that you all understand that uh, what you're doing will not only be beneficial uh, to the residents of Philadelphia, but it has the potential to reverberate across the country as we sit here in a time where lots and lots and lots of communities are eager to rethink the way that we uh, provide for public safety to ensure that we're doing it in a way that is just, in a way that is equitable, but frankly, a lot of folks aren't quite sure how to do it, and, and your leadership is, is uh, really, really important for many of us. So I'm simply here to share my appreciation uh, for the work that you're doing and the way you're doing it um, and to, to say that I look forward to continued partnership as uh, we uh, continue to study what you do as we try to solve our problems here in Evanston, Illinois. Mr. Mayor, if it's okay, can I ask you, um, you said you are an hour outside of Chicago? Uh, no, we border Chicago, so we are directly Borders. north of Chicago, correct. And, and may, may I further ask, describe your situation and the kinds of stops that may occur in your town. I mean, we try to get a sense of the, the scope of the problem where you are in the Midwest. Well, you know, we have about an eight to one uh, racial disparity uh, in terms of the ratio between uh, the makeup of our traffic stops as compared to the makeup of our, of our community. In the most recent census, our community was only 16% uh, African American. Uh, you know, their community is north of 50% white. Uh, and yet, if you compare that ratio to the, the ratio of our traffic stops, you get an eight to one disparity. Um, and, and we've really gone down a lot of the same path that, that you all have. I mean, obviously, we are interested in, in road safety. We understand that some of uh, the traffic stops that occur are necessary to maintain safety on the road. But we also see that a significant portion of our traffic stops are um, due to equipment um, violations that are fundamentally in most cases unrelated to questions of actual safety on the road they're often pretexts uh, and as we know when when folks are pulled over owing to pretexts well sometimes that's because a specific investigation has said hey this is an important card to track because we're concerned that a crime might be likely to occur but a lot of the time there's a real broad brush that gets used and and there are racial stereotypes that are used there are certain neighborhoods of our community that tend to be majority African-American that are more heavily policed, and so more of the pretextual stops tend to occur in those neighborhoods. And and so what we wind up with is um, the, the same situation that many uh, members of the council of this committee articulated in their opening comments, which is to say that, um, you know, for a lot of young, white Evanstonians, contact with the police is extremely limited. And for uh, many young, black Evanstonians, especially, 
especially African American men. Uh, constant uh, contact with the police is extremely regular, uh, leading to any number of, um, at a minimum, frayed trust problems between community and the police. But unfortunately, sometimes it gets much worse than that with. Uh, um, racial, deliberate racial bias in terms of who's pulled over. And, and our effort is to root all of that out. And I think starting to understand how we can handle the question of road safety by being very, very different than what we're currently being in terms of how we do traffic stops is a really useful starting point. Mr. Mayor, thank you for your compassion, vision, um, and um, doing your due diligence. You are to the, the big city like Ardmore and um, I'm gonna get, I guess Sheltonham and Darby are to us. So thank you for, for caring enough to do your research. Um, you. Councilman Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. And uh, good afternoon, Mayor Biss. It's good to see you again. I uh, just want to take a moment to thank you for being here today. I know your time is very limited. Um, so we had the, uh, and I want to thank the administration for being a little flexible for us today with the technical difficulties and everything else that's going on. We appreciate you still taking the time to talk about this. Just one question real quick before we let you go, or unless other members of the committee have questions. Um, you uh, talked about the fact that um, you guys are looking at models across the country. What other models are you looking at besides uh, what we're trying to do here in the city of Philadelphia? And um, do you think those models um, that you're looking at are as far along as we are as it relates to address, addressing the civil rights crisis? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So so three communities that we've been in touch with are uh, Berkeley, California, uh, Ithaca, New York, and Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. Uh, one thing I neglected to mention about Evanston is we're the home of Northwestern University. So the notion of a being a kind of not enormous college town like both Berkeley and uh, Ithaca are is sort of matches us in some respects. Um, and I would say that they're they're all doing bold things as well, and we've we've learned from all of them as well. Um, but what I, you know, frankly, one thing that distinguishes Philadelphia is I think a lot of these other communities um, initially deliberately bit off more than they could chew. Right? They've said, you know, here's our grand plan, here's our long term vision, and now they got to go back to square one and kind of figure out the initial implementation steps. And, and what what you've chosen to do is put in place a very concrete actionable piece of legislation that's, you know, as I understand it, ready today for consideration for a vote uh, that could be implemented quickly and, and make a real difference when it comes to um, the racial inequities that are that exist right now in, in Philadelphia. And I, I think that's been important for us to learn from that, you know, having a vision and a value set is, is critical, of course, but that doesn't replace actually doing the nitty gritty work of, of, you know, establishing the concrete legislative action that changes what's happening on the ground. So, we can start to have a more just situation. Mayor, thank you again. I appreciate you. It's a pleasure to work with you thus far. And of course, my team and I, we look forward to continuing to work with you throughout the course of this process. So thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here and for all of your uh, very inspiring work. Thank you, Member Thomas. Uh, are there any other questions for this panelist? If not, thank you for taking the time to testify to this committee. Your insight is valuable uh, to how we decide to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Williams, who is next to testify? The next panel of witnesses uh, will be Inspector Francis Healy and Keir Bradford Gray. Two individuals who are not unfamiliar uh, with how we do things. So please state your name and begin your testimony. I'm, uh, I'll defer to uh, the defender to go first. Oh, well, thank you, Inspector. Very nice to see you. Um, good morning, Council. And I want to thank you, uh, Councilman Isaiah Thomas, for inviting me here to speak today about this bill. I know that you know I was really intricately involved in this and thought that you'd be the perfect person to just analyze the information that the Defender Association had been able to give you in terms of what we were doing in our city and with regard to policing. But before I get into that, my name is Keir Bradford Gray. 
Um, I was the former chief defender of the Defender Association of Philadelphia when this began. I am currently a partner at Montgomery McCracken Walker and Rhodes. Um, still very interested in these very these issues that kind of uh, we're dealing with with regard to police culture and uh, issues of racial profiling and bias. We've been talking about these issues of police culture and racial profiling for many decades. I can't tell you uh, since I've been born and been able to really comprehend that we've been dealing with this and really have had no real way to, to stop it because it is a culture issue. This particular bill presents a, a huge step in acknowledging some of the cultural issues that are that uh, communities of color deal with when in, interacting with law enforcement and trying to do something about some of the needless interactions that our communities face. And when I say our communities, I mean black and brown communities uh, face when trying to figure out whether or not they fit into this paradigm of public safety. So what I say, what Councilman Thomas's bill really does is it seeks to put some kind of metric in to understand what we should be doing to bring us closer to public safety and what we should not be doing so that we can be the community policing paradigm that we proclaim that we want to be. And so we, the Defender Association, brought to Councilman Thomas an understanding of all the stops that were going on in the city of Philadelphia. We were able to pull this data from the Philadelphia Police Department's data. So this is not data that has been generated by us or some other entity that has no understanding of what's happening. It is data that we were able to gain from the police department itself when they are entering information about the stops that they, they have uh, done. And so in that motor vehicle violation stop calculation, we looked at through a period of a year, October 2018 to October to September 2019, and we analyzed over 309,000 stops. And of that 309,000 stops, 72% of those stops were represented by black drivers. Black drivers in the city of Philadelphia, while only 15% of those stops were represented by white drivers, um, and 8% white Hispanic. Of those, we, the arrest rate for the motor vehicle stops for black drivers was 1%. The arrest rate for white drivers was 0.98. When you looked at the ticket rate for those motor vehicle stops, we saw that black drivers represented 9%, even though there were 72% of the drivers stopped, and white drivers represented 14%. So this is getting us to a correlation of when they stopped white drivers, they were for more legitimate purposes. And they actually did things that advance those public safety measures when they stopped white drivers. Although white drivers only represented 15% of the stops. But 72% of those stops overwhelmingly did not result in many things, such as a ticket or even a return on that investment of time and resource. And so when we look at that, we wanted to understand what are these stops for? And many of these stops were for very minor traffic violations. Not to say that there weren't legitimate stops within this, this 309,000 uh, uh, motor vehicle stop um, uh, metrics that we were looking at, but many of them were for minor traffic infractions that did not impact public safety. They were things that went with the vehicle, emission sticker, one of four taillights being uh, out. Things that could be a easy fix if people had a warning or some kind of understanding that these things need to be done within a certain amount of time. There is a less intrusive way to deal with a motor vehicle that is not fully compliant, but is not a reckless, um, in, in a, any kind of reckless endangerment to anyone else on the road. It's just that we need your, your car to be fully compliant. So that when we were looking at these things, we were looking at it with the questions as, is this a good investment of our resources for policing? Because remember, we were able to see not only the stops, but the time the stop started, as well as the time the stop ended. And when we calculated how much time it took to do 309,000 stops in that year, we calculated if it was only one police officer present, that it would tantamount to 8.5 years in shift hours. So if a shift is seven or eight hours and not really great with the shift if it's, I don't know, from a, uh, 3 to 11, um, and if that represents a whole eight hours, it would take 8.5 years for one officer you know, on a daily shift to complete the types of stops that we were talking about. That's a lot of resource time. That's a lot of time spent. 
And what did we get for our internal investment? We got people who represented a huge community uh, of black and brown folks, low income folks that felt violated, that felt embarrassed, that felt preyed upon, and that felt like they did not have a partnership with law enforcement so that when law enforcement needed to solve crimes in that area, they didn't have many people to partner with, at least not from the people that we were able to glean from in terms of are they willing to help law enforcement solve the crimes that are in their community. Because of the agitation, because of the devastation that they have, have felt over the years of this type of policing initiative, which is really a racial profiling type of police initiative when you look at the data. Because if the data suggests that white drivers produce far more and contraband as well as motor vehicle violations that were that, that deserved a ticket, then why are we continuing to stop black drivers at such a high rate? And so those are the things that we look at when we want a city that is far more productive in advancing the qualities of life for everyone, the public safety for everyone. If I feel like I am less valued, if I feel like I am preyed upon because of what I look like, do I feel safe in this community? And on top of that, if I am come from a community where there's high violence and that is not solved because I don't know if the police are working with me as a partner, then I don't feel safe even more. So these are things that I really laud uh, our new police commissioner for looking at and advancing. Um, I also laud her, her staff for healing for being pragmatic in this approach and understanding that there are, there are far more things that police can be doing to help us bring us closer to public safety. And some of these things that they're not doing, well, while they're agreeing to not do uh, or not stop people in these certain particular infractions, we have to monitor that over time and see whether or not it's also worth this type of investment too. But right now, this is an actionable thing that we can do to take steps to cure some of the racial profiling that we've been dealing with and we've been marching about for several, several decades. And of course, after George Floyd, we had a huge validation of the difference in policing in communities. And I think many people who never really believed that it was true saw front and center that there are differences and there are assumptions and biases that really go to the treatment of these people in these communities. And so with that, I want to say this, this bill represents a step, a huge step in a cultural dynamic that we need to be dealing with. It comes at a time, yes, where we are we're seeing an increased uh, violent epidemic in our city. I uh, allowed the, the courage of council to not be skewed by the fact that there is this violence and this opportunity to address some real cultural issues and dynamics and racial profiling, because we can do both. This actually will help us improve our communication and improve working with communities to solve these crimes. Thank you again for uh, allowing me to speak, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Ms. Gray, it's always enlightening to hear you comment on whatever the subject matter dealing with law, law enforcement, defending uh, the rights of citizens. So what I'm going to ask my members is to hold questions until um, uh, we get our panel all the way through, and then we can ask questions to both panelists, if that is the will of the group. Hearing no objections, can you um, begin your testimony? Um, yes. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Jones and other members of the Committee on Public Safety. My name is Francis Healy, and I'm the Special Advisor to Commissioner Outlaw. First, on behalf of Commissioner Outlaw, I'd like to thank this committee for giving the Police Department the opportunity to provide its support for both Bills 210635 and 210636 introduced by Councilman or Council Member Thomas. Uh, as many of you may be aware, the Philadelphia Police Department had been voluntarily operating under a settlement agreement in the Bailey versus City of Philadelphia matter for many years. So just have to put them in his car or give them to if they yeah. come normally if they come to sign it. him to sign off on the bills. Yeah, we would. Um, Can we please put our um, cameras on mute? We're hearing your conversation about moving cars. Okay, thank please you. Continue your testimony, sure. please. While the department has been credited with vast improvements in policy, practices, and accountability um, of the pedestrian and vehicle stops, these gains have been accomplished by working collaboratively with the plaintiff's counsel over the years. However, for many years, the issue of racial disparity in our stops has been debated among our city experts and the plaintiff's experts. But in June of 2020, 
the city's expert was unable to statistically discount racial disparities in certain stops regarding the quality of life offenses. As such, the PPD, along with Plaintiff's Council, again, collaborated to identify potential program and policy changes that had the potential to mitigate or eliminate the racial disparities that were identified. Accordingly, to date, we have implemented several pilot programs where we are uh, modifying the enforcement of quality of life, uh, quality of life offenses. It's a critically important, and the commissioner made, wanted me to make this clear, um, that we have not abandoned quality of life enforcement, uh, but rather modified such enforcement. Um, it's this modified approach that we believe can address the racial disparities without compromising public safety. So for this reason, the PPD is grateful to Council Member Thomas for allowing the PPD to work collaboratively with his team in the development of this legislation being introduced today. It is important to state that this bill being presented today, like I said, does not abandon enforcement um, of uh, certain, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read in the dark here, I apologize, uh, equipment uh, related to traffic offenses, but rather modify such enforcement. So those who argue that we're abandoning enforcement, that is not the case whatsoever. So it's important that all actions and messaging associated with these actions are focused in the same direction. All the work we're doing with the Bailey case, uh, as long as well with this bill, need to be focused in the same direction. It's important um, not only for the community, but also for the officers to have the clear and concise message. Um, these bills, we believe, will work in conjunction with the Bailey pilot program already in place and will create a synergy to address the racial disparity, but equally important without compromising public safety. And this is a short and sweet, um, but I really just want to say very clearly up front is um, the ability of uh, Council Member Thomas and his staff to work with the police department, I think, was unprecedented in this case. As we all know, this started out as a rather contentious, um, uh, I don't know the word for it, but um, it was rather contentious. But I think uh, under the direction of Commissioner Outlaw, she really sat down and said, listen, she's a reform minded individual. We've done a lot of reforms proactively long before the Floyd matter came to came to light regrettably um, but we've taken it even a step further so this is not a far stretch for her as well as her administration so I was proud to work with the councilman and his, and his people and like I said we we came to terms on a lot of things and it wasn't easy but this is a collaborative effort a true collaborative effort and I think it's a start I think this in combination with all the other efforts that we're doing in the department we can see that we're trying to address public safety but without compromising the community we understand what it's like to be stopped repeatedly over and over again. We're, we haven't forgot that. I, I may be white, but I still get scared when the lights don't go on behind me. So I couldn't imagine that happening on a daily basis. So I do empathize. Um, so we are trying to do better. And I think this is the first step. And I appreciate the council member for putting forth all his efforts and the ability to collaborate with us. It really did make a lot it personally for me. And I know it made a big difference for the police commissioner as well. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. I am officially going to turn over the gavel to Vice Chair Johnson, uh, but I would like to ask one question. To what degree is there synergy between what the experimental process in the 14th that Member Bass uh, is right. doing in her district? Is there any connectivity there, public policy well, the, connect the, the connectivity is the low-level offenses that we're, we're enforcing. Or we're modifying enforcement. These are low-level traffic enforcements. Those are, are low-level quality of life enforcement. So, um, you know, uh, disorderly crowds um, and those type of things are being handled almost in the same fashion. So we're doing that in the 14th district, but we're also doing a body camera review program in five other police districts where um, the, the officers are, are required to uh, basically give warnings prior to and they'll do the on the body camera. So we have a multiple things going forward on these low level offenses because it seems from the data, again, very clearly, like I'm not a statistician, so I don't really want to get into the data too deep, but we all agree disparity exists. So the disparities existing at these low level and their uh, offenses. So we're trying to attack it on all different levels with the traffic stops, with the quality of life violations, the code violations, the uh, low level state uh, offenses. So we're looking at this as a synergy, meaning that the the way the officers are, are actually interacting with the community, because this is oftentimes the, the only interaction oftentimes people may have with a police officer for or the, for these low-level offenses. So um, if we can change the culture, and that's really what Commissioner Outlaw was, I think, brought here to do, uh, we're on well on our path, and this fits perfectly in lockstep with everything we're doing. That's why we've very much supported and appreciated the work of the council person. Councilman so, Jones, um, can I say something to that? Let me just do this. Sure. Member Johnson, are you there? 
Absolutely. All right, so I've officially turned over the gavel. Um, I'd like to be recorded as voting on I on all bills. Ms. Williams? I got you. Thank you so very much, guys. Mr. Chairman, um, we should touch base with you later on, and I'll officially move forward. Is that okay? That's fine with me. Thank you so very much, guys. You're welcome. Uh, and so I have a question um, that I wanted to ask um, Inspector Hilly just to get some additional clarity on. C can you give me an idea? I remember doing the reports around gun violence. We looked at the transition from stop and frisk to actually um, car, pull, you know, pulling cars over as it relates to gun violence. Talk about this legislation, how it's not having an impact on the police ability to pull people over in terms of retrieving guns, or if it is, but I don't think you would be here if it is. But just give some clarity to that, because I do remember a report that was given around gun violence about the amount of guns that were retrieved um, from, um, you know, pulling individuals over in cars. And, and, and then also, um, just re, re clarify how, and I just want to do this for the record, because, you know, I get the calls about, you know, our approach in council, and, you know, I just want additional clarity on how the Philadelphia Police Department will still go after individuals with guns in cars, and this does not hinder their process. And I think here Bradford kind of alluded to the actual data and numbers in terms of yeah. who's being um, pulled over and why they're being pulled over, but can you just highlight this? Because it's easy to run with a narrative as, you know, we're just being soft on gun violence with these types of proposals. Um, yeah, let me uh, address that. The, the issue here is that this is not stopping police officers from making um, legitimate public safety stops. So if there's a reasonable suspicion stop, this is not affecting that whatsoever. If I believe you have reasonable, or reasonable suspicion or probable cause you're involved in criminal activity, I can make the stop. Um, the best way to explain this is um, we are we have mirrored what the state law has done with regard to the um, seatbelt law. The seatbelt laws in Pennsylvania are it's considered a secondary offense. So basically, the officers won't be stopping or citing somebody based solely on that alone. However, if they observe some other type of offense, go through a stop sign, you do some type of moving violation, the officers can still stop you. And at that point, and only at that point, will they be able to issue the a citation for the the, uh, I think the seven enumerated offenses we identified. So what they're doing is they're not going to be overtly stopping people for the safety violations that we uh, that had been routinely used. Uh, uh, the headlights out, as the offender mentioned, those type of low-level offenses. Now, we can cite them, but only if I stop you for something more egregious. So we're not stopping or actually not prohibiting or abandoning enforcement. Um, most bad guys, I'll be very honest with you, they're carrying the guns. Um, the uh, equipment violations are usually not the only violation they're committing. So oftentimes the stops are predicated on um, uh, stop signs, red lights, um, excessive speed, careless driving, those type of things we're still fully able to be involved with. And like I said, if probable cause exists, we'll get the warrant for the car and, and retrieve the firearms. So I don't think this is going to adversely impact. I, mean, I know on its face some people may argue that this seems to be at odds with what we really want to do, but in reality, it's not. We can still do what we need to do with the confines that we're putting on ourselves right now. I, and I'm glad I wanted you to say that um, for the record, because um, I've gotten in comments, not from civilians, but from officers, just to be quite frank, or former officers. And so I just wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, we're all on the same page in terms of the narrative and what can actually be done versus what can't be done. And so... Um, thank you very much. Any other questions from members of the committee? Okay, hearing none. Um, thank you very much, Inspector Healy. Thank you for your hard work as always. And will Samantha please call the next witness? I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I had my hand up. I'm, I wanted to ask. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Councilman Thomas? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before I even jump in, I know uh, Chief Public Defender uh, Bradford Gray wanted to add some remarks to what um, Inspector Hilly said, and then I was going to ask a few questions after that. Yeah, thank you. So I just wanted to say that this was done very intentionally looking at the data about the return, meaning the, the number of guns that were, that were confiscated with these types of motor vehicle stops. And the number of guns that represented a, a population of 309,000 
was extremely limited, uh, meaning it, it, it wasn't even 1%. It wasn't even, uh, it, it was 0.17% uh, of the time. So we're talking about 309,000 stops, and you may have found something when you had a legitimate reason to, to look uh, less than 1% of the time. So all the time spent stopping people, looking for, for things, never really came to fruition. And we, we uh, Councilman Thomas and, of course, the police department factored that in and looking at are these, ty are these the types of, of stops that we need in order to confiscate some of the illegal weapons that are on the street presently? And the answer was no, it's not getting us closer to that. In fact, it's just pulling us away from the type of community policing we need to really find out who's doing the shooting in solving those murders, in solving those crimes. So, the, I mean, this is really effective police. And I think we've taken it for granted that police have to do certain things in order to bring us closer to public safety. But what Councilman Thomas, the police department, the Defender Association did was audit that initiative. Is this truly working the way we want it to? And is this really helping us to stop these illegal guns that are on the streets? And when you look at the data, this is not an anecdote. This is not an emotion. This is a fact from the data. The answer is no. So I, I really do hope that people hear that in this hearing that this is not going to hinder the ability of the police officers doing their, their job as, the, as it's prescribed. It is going to reduce the racial profiling aspect of that job which is never, never an effective tool for public safety. Thank you, Chief Public Defender. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, thank you, um, um, Inspector Haley. I think that it's been an honor to work with you and the entire team throughout the course of the process. As I said in the opening remarks, I think um, Commissioner Outlaw um, as well, because again, it's been a collaborative effort. And I think that uh, what you talked about as far as this being a historic moment in the sense of the type of collaboration we've had and the intentions that we have, I think it's something that um, something that hopefully other people can replicate across the country. Um, before we close out, I, and I think you guys have given us a lot of information, before we close out this panel, um, I did want to just uh, briefly address um, how we anticipate uh, moving forward with the legislation. Um, so we are in a space right now where uh, we've um, had a significant amount of dialogue and uh, Inspector Haley, um, if you could talk about from your perspective how you see us going forward after today's committee hearing and uh, public De Chief Public Defender Bradford Grant to talk about the, the data side of it and why we want to monitor this moving forward so it's not just a one-off situation, it's a situation where we want to modify and assure that um, um, we're, we're doing what the data uh, suggests we do as it relates to once this uh, or, or anticipating if the bill is passed into law. So if you both could briefly answer uh, those separate questions, I think that um, that would be appreciated for this panel. Um, sure, I'll go first, if it's okay. Um, with respect to this panel, we've been we've been anticipating all summer. Uh, so the problem is it's the summertime, so it's, it's a little difficult getting anything done in the summer. But the issue is um, we are working on, the, the implementation of city ordinances is usually done via departmental directive that it applies to. So with with Philadelphia, we'll be modifying our existing directives. Uh, I double checked with my research and planning unit that actually does that. They are in the process of modifying the directives so is that the department will be in compliance with the law once it becomes effective. Um, I'll be very honest. Uh, we, when we initially argued this, or not argued, but debated it, um, we initiated immediate um, uh, effective immediately upon signing. I'm doing my best to make sure that we can get that done, but the commissioner outlaw was very clear that not only do we just want to change policy, we want to make sure that we adequately put together a training package so we just don't push written policy out to a bunch of officers and they really don't understand it, grasp it, and don't follow it. So uh, the way it works in the Philadelphia Police Department is once the law is finalized and signed by the mayor, we usually then take that final version and then work on our directive. I've been doing that in advance, hoping there's no serious modifications or changes. So we're already got the ball rolling. Um, but once that's finalized is when we would really like to do like no, no more than like a, a 30 day, you know, just get all the training done that we want to get done exactly what the commissioner wants to get done. Cause this is in fact a cultural change in the department. So if, if that's amenable, that would be great for us. If not, we'll work with what we have to work with. Um, but that's how it works within the Philadelphia police department to get laws implemented in the Philadelphia Police Department. Once it's finalized, we create the directive or we modify an existing directive. And then we actually, if it's necessary, we'll do training. Some things are so minor, you don't need to do a full training blitz. But we, the commissioner really was adamant that we should 
take a step back and do a full training blitz on this, uh, not just to push out a memo saying here's a change in a policy, but um, we has, she has put messaging out over the summer, so the officers are aware of it, so we didn't want to just throw it at them and they not know about it, or more importantly, they didn't read about it in the press before they heard it from her. Um, so we put a, a she a, she put out a very very well written message uh, to the troops earlier this summer, and that's the process where we're going right now. Did I answer your question, sir? Yes, um, and I know that uh, Chief Public Defender, former Chief Public Defender Gray, I wanted her to um, move forward. Right. Uh, so uh, thank you for that, and I I think that the good thing about this bill is that it's really concrete. It just spells out specific instances in which the police are no longer be able to pull people over for a primary offense. So this is not a really complicated situation, but I, I, I appreciate uh, what Fran Haley said in terms of really changing that dynamic and culture that you have to message that several times as being a, 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 uh, a executive director of a, of a larger organization. I know you have to reiterate these things several times, but I would say this in terms of monitoring with the data, we're going to need police officers to continue to do things like they've been doing, tracking their stops, the reasons why, who they're stopping, what they got in return from that stop. We call it a hit rate, meaning what was confiscated because of that stop. And so those will allow us to monitor what kind of stops are going on and for what and why we're and what they're getting in the return from the return on that investment. Also, we need to look at the data correlation between stops going down and if crime is going up and see if there is some kind of connection between the two. Or if stops go down and crime stays the same or even goes down, we know this is definitely working. Right now, and we had a situation where at the height of, of, of stop and frisk, crime was still up high. So it was saying that this correlation and this type of initiative wasn't really getting us to where we needed to be. Now, there was also times where stop and frisk was at a high and crime was down. So there's different reasons for different things that we're going to have to really crunch the numbers and analyze it from an unbiased perspective. But I think I do think it all starts with accurate recording of why people are being stopped, as as uh, Inspector Healy talked about, called the Bailey data, which is a requirement that the police check off boxes for every reason every person stopped and the reasons why that should be continued and that should be done thoroughly uh by the police department so that we can really look at what's happening thank you i appreciate it one one, one more question um inspector healy in the midst of your uh response um i think that um it was a little different than some of the things that we had discussed um in the past and i know that there might be um a, a change in um I, I don't i'm not quite sure but i wanted to just briefly asked about um, the executive order com co compared to a directive. What, what would be the difference between, um, why, why would we want to move into the direction of a directive instead of the executive order? Well, not, not a directive. The directives are, just so to be clear, they're, they're internal. The Philadelphia Police Department has a directive for everything we do. That's an internal standard operating procedure for internally. Um, the executive order, I think we had discussed, or the matching director's order, either or, um, there are there are potentially legal arguments as to, and I won't talk for the law department, as to the legislature mandating what a um, the executive branch can do or can't do. So rather than deal with that, um, much like they did with the small amount of marijuana, the mayor in that situation put forth an executive order mandating what his officers will do. The mayor can dictate what he wants his executive staff to do. Um, so it kind of it, it unblurred any lines or any misconceptions anybody would have had. So, like I said, we're on board with this. We're going to move forward with this. Um, but also from a clarity perspective, the executive order would make it rock solid or, or whatever the administration decides, which is the best way to do this. But this coming from directly from the managing director or the mayor specifically is a very clear mandate for the police department. And that way there, we're all on firm ground. It's just the way we did it with a small amount of marijuana. And that seems to have worked very well. So I think that's the the manner in which your folks wanted to move forward, and I I didn't have any objections with that myself personally. Thank you, thank you, Inspector Haley. I appreciate it, and again, uh, thank you to uh, former Chief Public Defender Kira Bradford Gray. I appreciate you both throughout the course of the process. Without you, we wouldn't be where we are right now. So thank you. Thank you so much, Councilman. Thank you for for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the leverage. I appreciate it as well too. of witnesses um, are Kate Parker and Lance Hannon.
Good afternoon. Um, my name is Catherine Parker, Kate Parker. I'm not sure if there's an order in which we're supposed to speak or not. But hearing none. Uh, Kate, you were listed first, so you can testify first if you'd like. Okay, thanks, Sam. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Chairperson Jones, Vice Chairperson Johnson, of course, the primary bill sponsor, Council Member Thomas, other esteemed members of the Public Safety Committee. My name is Kate Parker. I'm the Policy Director at the Defender Association of Philadelphia. On behalf of my colleagues, our Board of Directors, Acting Chief Alan Tauber, and the communities that we serve, I really thank and appreciate the opportunity to speak at today's hearing. Before I begin, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge both Councilmember Thomas and our former Chief Keir Bradford Gray for their leadership on this issue, as well as commend the other stakeholders who worked so diligently to be part of a very data-driven process to come up with the provisions of the bills that we're speaking about today. At first glance, you know, these bills might um, look like relatively minor tweaks, um, but I want to really acknowledge that they have the capacity to transform both the experience of black and brown motorists in the city, as well as the transparent uh, reporting of data that is absolutely necessary to monitor the enforcement of the motor vehicle code um, in our city. They also have the opportunity to really change the dynamic between law enforcement and the communities they serve and build partnership between the relatively new uh, Citizens Police Oversight Committee Commission and the community. Um, and so I don't need to go into too much detail. I've submitted a lot of written materials um, laying out the reasons why this bill is absolutely necessary. And we've heard from the witnesses who've testified before me that the data confirms the experience of, of many black and brown motorists in the city, that currently and historically, the motor vehicle code violations um, have consistently and persistently been used as a pretext to disproportionately stop and search black and brown drivers. Um, without going into much detail, what I can say is that while motor vehicle stops generally have fallen um, beginning in 2020 as a result of the pandemic, the racial disparities that we see has actually gotten worse. Black Philadelphians are 44% of the city's population. We estimate they comprise about 34% of drivers, and yet 74% of people stopped in the city um, from Jan January of 2020 through March of 2021 were black drivers. And not only has that disparity gotten worse, but what we also see is that the intrusion rate, um, the instances whereby people are searched or frisked, their cars are searched or frisked, has also increased. During that same time period, about three quarters of all motorists stopped um, were African American drivers, and 56, I'm sorry, not stopped, searched, and 56% of them were between the age of 20 and 39 and were male. And this just suggests and confirms what we've been talking about, that historically and currently black motorists just enjoy less freedom from intrusion while they're driving. And that less evidence of any kind of criminal activity is required to justify the search or the frisk of their person or their vehicle. And these bills, they work in conjunction to address this persistent problem, right? This, this isn't a, a recent trend. This isn't in response to the pandemic. This is something that has been consistently part of the practice um, in neighborhoods throughout the city. And we anticipate that th these bills working together can do a couple of really important things. Firstly, it should reduce overall motor vehicle code violations um, by perhaps 35%. It's a little bit tricky to estimate um, how often these are the primary offenses and now they're being moved to secondary offenses, but some of them are a little bit difficult because we don't know how many of the lights being stopped will fall under this new rubric. Um, but also what it does, um, this collaborative process helped us pick these particular infractions because they were not going to compromise public safety. They were not going to compromise pedestrian safety. They were not going to compromise 
traffic safety. And so it was multiple stakeholders from multiple communities who represented the interests of pedestrians, of uh, people who were cyclists in the city, people who were walkers and had very strong feelings about traffic safety overall in the city as well. This um, bill, and lots of folks have talked about the secondary offenses component, but if we can also talk a little bit about the data reporting requirements this bill provides public access to information to continue to monitor the way that the motor vehicle code is enforced in the city. And that's in, that, that is important and transformative because it empowers our community to do the very same kind of analysis that our office was able to do to prepare the materials that we submitted in advance of today's hearing and to prepare the materials that we've been submitting as part of the conversation about how to use the data to make really smart choices. It also elevates the Citizens Police Oversight Commission by encouraging our local police department to work together to bring best practices um, to the city so that we can ensure that we are right at the cutting edge in making sure that racially discriminatory enforcement of the Motor Vehicle Code is not something that our kids or our grandkids will have to know about or experience. And finally, it provides uh, council with information annually so that council can continue to respond to calls for safer, more effective systems. The last thing that this bill does, um, you know, folks may not always notice that this bill is effective immediately, which means that as soon as it is signed and as soon as the mayor's office takes its actions to implement it, Average, ordinary people in the city of Philadelphia will benefit from this effort. And within one year of its implementation, all of the data concerning the motor vehicle code violations are going to be available on a monthly basis for From committee, Council Member Johnson. Um, yes, it looks like Channel sixty four is out temporarily. Any questions okay. or comments from members of the committee? Hearing none, Councilman Thomas, you have any comments? Yes, Council Member Johnson. I um I didn't know if you want to do the entire panel, um, but if we're going to just do, um, Kate, just Kate, it's up to you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, let's finish the entire panel and then you can take it from there. Mercury. Thank you. Mercury. You're welcome. Yeah. State your name for the record and begin. Good afternoon, distinguished Council Members and uh, fellow Philadelphians. My name is Lance Hannon. Uh, I am a professor of sociology and criminology at Villanova University who conducts quantitative research on a variety of issues related to crime and justice. I have experience analyzing Philadelphia's vehicle and pedestrian stop data, and I have published a number of peer-reviewed articles relating to that data. I am here today because I feel that my professional knowledge may be helpful for evaluating Bill 210-636 and Bill 210-635. Statisticians with the Stanford Open Policing Project, arguably the leading experts on traffic stop dynamics, utilize recent Philadelphia data to illustrate the variety of techniques one can use to empirically assess bias-based policing. They go through the calculation of several indicators and note that in each case, the Philadelphia data suggests significant bias against black drivers. For example, using census benchmarking, they concluded that black drivers are stopped at a rate 3.4 times higher than white drivers. Applying a statistical technique known as the threshold test, they concluded that, quote, 
Officers are indeed applying lower thresholds when deciding to search black and Hispanic drivers than when deciding to search white drivers, end quote. Still for me, the Stanford group's most powerful statement was, quote, looks like no matter how you slice it, the veil of darkness test shows racial profiling of black drivers is present in Philly traffic stops, end quote. I found this conclusion striking because the veil of darkness test rarely produces false positives, cases where the test confuses bias uh, with some other factor. The test exploits natural variation in sunlight throughout the year, uh, as well as daylight savings time, uh, and is based on the relatively simple notion that officers who are engaged in bias-based policing will be less capable of discerning a driver's race when it is dark. So if stops made after dark have a smaller proportion of black drivers than stops made in sunlight, this suggests racial bias against black motorists. I was so struck by the Stanford group's statement that I decided to take a look at the data myself to see if it was indeed true that, quote, no matter how you slice it, end quote, the veil of darkness test indicates bias against black drivers. Along with colleagues Malik Neal and Alex Gustafson, I wondered if the test ever indicated bias against white drivers, especially when they are traveling through neighborhoods that are overwhelmingly black. What we found was that even in areas where white males might stand out as suspicious, the ability to more clearly discern race and sunlight remained an advantage for them and a disadvantage for black motorists. Our statistical models indicated that black males were 22% more likely to be stopped when their race and gender was more visible due to sunlight. In my professional opinion, the data strongly support the need for Bill 210-636 as a measured remedy for unequal policing in Philadelphia. In my view, Bill 210-636 appropriately prioritizes the reduction of pretextual stops as a major source of racial disparity. It also facilitates successful implementation with its parsimonious structure, uh, the distinction between primary and secondary violations. Uh, and it also enables productive police work rather than restricting it, as some have argued. I also believe that the companion piece, um, Bill 210-635, makes a number of significant contributions. First and foremost, it allows for independent monitoring of the possibility that Bill 210-636 could introduce side or substitution effects. Uh, that is, uh, the creation of a new category of pretextual stop. Second, and relatedly, Bill 210-635 promotes transparency and thus legitimacy at a crucial point in policing history. Third, rather than overburdening the police with new record-keeping duties, Bill 210-635 rightfully focuses on information already captured on the 7848A. In sum, I believe that both bills 210-635 and 210-636 represent a rare blend of innovative and pragmatic thought. I look forward to the day that I will see Philadelphia featured not as an example where numerous statistical tests all point to racial bias in policing practices, but rather as a national leader in evidence-based justice reform. Thank you for your time. Councilman Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do. Um, I just want to thank this panel for uh, all their support throughout the course of the process and for all the data and fact driven uh, information as well as their testimony today. Um, I know we're running a little short on time, so I don't want to um, I don't want to belabor the point. I don't know if any of my colleagues or any members of the committee have questions for this panel. But um, Councilmember uh, Johnson, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to say thank you to both of them for their work and their advocacy in this space is very much appreciated and their expertise is something that we've relied on throughout the course of this process over several months, especially Kate and the work that she's done with the work group in the public defender's office and uh, supporting our office as well too. So thank you. Thank you both and thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. 
If there's no questions or comments from members, other members of the committee, um, would the clerk please call the next panel? The next uh, witness will be Council Member Isaiah Thomas. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to uh, take a few moments to step down um, as it relates to my role um, as a member of this committee and offer some level of testimony as it relates to this bill specifically. Um, earlier uh, in our uh, dialogue today, Councilmember Jones talked about the idea of, of, of us having to have this talk with uh, young black men growing up in the city of Philadelphia. And I have described that as uh, a rites of passage um, for a lot of us uh, growing up in the city of Philadelphia, we we, we consider it a rites of passage to be pulled over uh, by police, by law enforcement, for us to be searched. Um, and like Councilmember Johnson talked about earlier, it's something that we uh, adjust to and feel like is, is the norm and it's just how things are supposed to be. But uh, similar to what Councilmember Green talked about, um, as it relates to this idea of black men uh, just knowing the uh, that is uh, um, it's a it's a known issue that we're going to have to face at some point in our life where we know we're going to have to be pulled over. Um, this bill looks to address that issue. A lot of us talked about the fact that we have children, specifically sons, and as it relates to our job and our role on council, we have a lot of different hats that we wear, and it will be unfortunate for my son or uh, Council Member Green's son or Council Member Gaudier's son to some. It's time in the future uh, be sitting in the same seats that we're sitting in right now, um, still fighting for an issue that we've been fighting for for nearly over a decade. Uh, Chief Public Defender Kerry Bradford Gray talked about um, the unfortunate situation that took place last year with George Floyd, and uh, she and I, as well as um, our chair, Council Member Johnson, are members of the Police Reform Working Group, and we've been working diligently as city and state elected officials on the legislative side to try to put ourselves in a position where we're able to offer some significant change as it relates to how communities of color are policed, uh, to put us in a position where we're not seeing some of these horrific uh, videos that we've seen across the country, to put us in a position where we're not seeing some of the unfortunate situations that have happened even here in the city of Philadelphia that often starts with a traffic stop. And we have a number of names and uh, people that we can call, and uh, I don't want to get into that because I don't want to miss someone and I don't want to offend anybody, but the one person who I can tell you about is myself. And I personally have uh, published op-eds that talked about my experience as it relates to driving in the city of Philadelphia. Um, and this comes from my time uh, being a teenager, uh, from my time uh, being a college student here in the city of Philadelphia, from my time being a father, getting pulled over with my son, from my time being uh, uh, an elected official, and even being pulled over after I won uh, the primary in 2019. So this is an issue that a lot of us have to live with on a consistent basis. Um, it's something that uh, we struggle with often. And I think what we're trying to do is put us in a position where we're addressing uh, what we call, again, uh, a cultural norm, uh, which is also a civil rights violation, and trying to put us in a position where this is no longer the norm. Again, for me, um, I think that what I, you know, I can talk about multiple times being pulled over, whether I was the driver or the passenger. I can talk about several experiences as it relates to being in the back of police officer cars, um, being searched in a way um, that was very much uh, a violation of, of, of my personal space. And, um, you know, some will call soft rape the way officers uh, search uh, young black men here in the city of Philadelphia. But I think the most disturbing a situation that I've been in is being pulled over uh, with my son, who's now nine years old. And that was his first interaction with law enforcement. And um, I did not plan to have any type of talk with my son as it relates to law enforcement and how to deal with police officers, because at the time, my son was only seven years old. And so uh, for me, um, it was extremely alarming. It was an unfortunate situation to be placed in. And I'm hoping that with legislation like this, uh, we will not have to put ourselves in a position where we have these horrific uh, experiences, uh, whether it's with our children or with friends and colleagues. Um, and, and, and these are things that we don't forget. Uh, these are things that last for the rest of our life. So I did want to take a couple minutes just to offer this from my perspective. And I know we've talked a lot about the gun violence issue in the city of Philadelphia. We care about that too. Uh, Chief Public Defender and Councilman Jones both said we can walk and chew gum at the same time. And this is an example of that. Uh, later on today, I'll be out 
um, in South Philadelphia with the chair of this committee uh, doing our due diligence to try to be tangible examples for young black men who look like us that come from where we come from uh, to try to inspire them to, to, to be their best self, to try to offer them some resources that can help them with whatever situation that they may be facing throughout the course of their transition from childhood uh, to adulthood. So we do care a lot about gun violence in the city of Philadelphia. But I'll tell you this. As a person who drives often, I live in Northwest Philadelphia. Uh, every day I have a, a significant commute to get to Center City. And when I decide to do things outside of my city, I mean outside of my neighborhood and outside of the Center City, um, the, the, the commute is much longer. I spend a lot of time driving and traveling across the city of Philadelphia. And I can tell you firsthand, I see a number of, my, uh, of motor vehicle code violations myself. I watch people speed in and out of lanes. I watch people turn uh, in spaces where they're not supposed to turn. I watch people run... Uh, stop signs and do things on a daily basis that are public safety hazards. And it happens so frequently that, unfortunately, we don't have enough law enforcement officers to put ourselves in a position to catch every one of these public safety violations. So at the end of the day, um, as the chair of the Streets and Services Committee, I know that we have issues around public safety and traffic. I know we have issues as it relates to the hit and run crisis that we're facing. And I'm 100 percent sure that we're fighting for those issues as it relates to our, our advocacy um, and investment in uh, infrastructure. So we recognize that those other issues exist, but we're asking folks before you pass judgment on this legislation to read the bill, to look at the things that we're, we're talking about as it relates to motor vehicle code violations and really ask yourself, do these things have an impact on public safety? Or are you trying to put uh, folks in position where they can continue to violate people's civil rights and they can continue to stereotype people uh, based on the color of their skin, their socioeconomic status, and or the community that they're specifically driving in. So, Mr. Chair, I want to thank you for allowing me uh, to serve as a witness uh, for this particular legislation. And I hope that my testimony helps my colleagues and the listening public um, as it relates to uh, developing your opinion on this specific legislation. Thank you again. Thank you, um, Councilman Thomas. Um, well, the... Clerk, please call the next witness. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're going to move on to public comment, and the first witness is Barbara Gurley. Hello. Um, I'm a member of Power Live Free Police Accountability Team. I'm also a mother of a young black son who was stopped many times by the police for no reason. Sometimes he was just riding around with his friends. Um, he left Philadelphia in 2012 to join the military. And I had a conversation with him about when he's driving and he's not in uniform, he is just another black man. 40% of Philadelphians are black, but over 70% of drivers pulled over by the police are black. We have a problem of discrimination. I support council members Isaiah Thomas driving equality agenda. This bill will reduce the number of stops by police for minor violations of the motor vehicle code. When there are less stops, there'll be less of a possible negative interaction by police with black and brown people. Too often we've seen in Philadelphia and in other cities across the country that a stop of an unarmed black or brown driver can escalate to violence and even death of the driver, as well as trauma for passengers in the car, especially children. These kind of stops decrease the trust of the community for the police. Police officers can use their time to enforce more serious violations of public safety. I urge city council to vote yes for driving equality agenda. Live Free recognizes the value of the publicly accessible data collection for this new venture to ensure equal treatment for all city drivers. Thank you. 
Thank, thank you very much. Will the clerk please call the next witness? The next witness is Reverend Halston. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, want to be able to thank council, um, Councilman Isaiah Thomas, uh, and all of you who sit on this council uh, committee, uh, Councilman Jones, Councilman Johnson, uh, and all on council for supporting uh, this bill. Uh, I am the senior advisor on policy and advocacy for the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office, but also uh, a reverend and clergy in this town. Um, let me say first that uh, I really want to congratulate the uh, police department, particularly Commissioner Daniel Outlaw, uh, for the acknowledgement of the racist practice uh, of stopping these vehicles uh, by the police department that she represents. Uh, that is the kind of truth telling and, and, uh, and admission uh, that leads to real repair, leads to real re reimagining public safety, and really leads us to reconciling our community, uh, uh, reconciling the community as a whole to the police department, that it is uh, an institution that is there to protect and to serve and to create safety. These kinds of recognitions over the course of the years uh, of recognizing this history that is a long history in the Philadelphia Police Department uh, is so valuable when those who are in leadership dare to recognize that. And I want to just lift her up uh, and lift that up as a part of this bill. Uh, and why I am so much in favor of this driver equality bill. Uh, obviously, the examples are clear from many, many years. Over the last five to six years, we have seen all over this nation uh, black people stopped and and many killed by those stops. I'm thinking of Walter Scott, who was stopped by a police officer and, and then shot in the back as uh, as he tried to flee. I'm thinking of Sandra Bland, as, I, as we saw the video of her being arrested uh, and then being put in jail. And we don't know what happened to her, but eventually her dying in jail. Philanda Castile received an uh, this person who was a school security guard uh, there with his fiance and her child uh, and shot brutally in that vehicle right in front of his fiance and child. We, we recall the, the, the Dante Wright who, who uh, supposedly was supposed to be tased but actually got shot. All of these examples are, would not have happened if there was no stop in the first place which is what makes this bill so powerful. I also think of Brandon Tate Brown right here in the city of Philadelphia who lost his life at a stop uh, because he was driving a vehicle that uh, for a young black man in that area didn't seem to be appropriate and, and there was some kind of altercation and then eventually him being shot to death. If the stop had never occurred, he would be living today and I'm thinking of Tanya uh, Dickinson, his mother, who had, who we stood with for so many days uh, around, and so many months around that issue, that this bill is now finally uh, trying to address the pain that she has gone through of losing her child. The statistics are rather clear. Uh, this is an ineffective police uh, practice. It does not really make us safer, and it's clearly racist at all as all the numbers indicate and so i stand with all those who stand with uh, councilman thomas about this bill that we need to make this change but we recognize as well that as we do this kind of work that we have to be ever vigilant because there are those who 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 racism is so insidious and has so historic even in our police departments but in our other institutions we have to recognize that some will, will come another way to try to do the same kinds of things that they have done that this bill is trying to address. And so I applaud all those on council who understand that and understand the vigilance necessary to dismantle racism brick by brick, law by law, policy by policy, 
It takes all of us working intently for a number of years to make the kind us and make Philadelphia the kind of city that we all would want it to be. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Reverend Holston. Will the clerk please call the next witness? Mr. Chairman, that was our last witness for today's hearing. Councilman Thomas, before we go into a uh, public meeting, the vote on the bill, do you have any other comments you would like to make? I do not, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. You're welcome. This concludes the public hearing of the committee. We will now go into a public meeting to consider the action be to be taken on the bills before this committee today. Will the clerk please call the roll? Council Member Thomas? Present. Council Member Green? Council Member Gautier? Uh, I'm present, sorry about that. Present. I'm sorry, I'm in the middle of council hearing, so we're trying to I vote on the bill. Um, give me just one quick moment. Um, yep. I've been monitoring this as we've been talking. Uh, Council Member Gim? I am present. Council Member Brooks? I am present. And Chairman Johnson? Present. Thank you. We will now go into our public meeting. Now, mm, one second. So because I am chairing, and actually I'm normally the person who's going to be recognized on the motion um, to call up the bill, I'm going to ask for um, Councilwoman Gim if I can send you a script to pull this bill up. Yep. Um, and so one second, Joshua Harris. Uh, I'm sorry, Samantha, can you send Councilwoman Gim a copy of the script real quick? Uh, yes, Councilwoman, I sent a script um, about maybe 30 minutes ago. Um, yeah, I can try to send it again if you didn't. I'll send it again right now. Thank you, Samantha. No problem. Thank you, Councilwoman Gim. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Council, uh, Chair Johnson, I have the script. Okay, the chair recognizes Councilwoman Gim for a motion on bills number 210-635 and 210-636. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I move that bill numbers 210-635 and 210-636 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of these bills at the next session of council. Could I, Can get, I get a, a second? Second. 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 The chair notes for the record that Councilwoman Gardier seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that bills number 210635 and 210636 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of these bills at the next session of council 
All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the ayes have it, and the motion carries. This concludes the meeting. The business before the committee on public safety today, I want to take a moment to um, acknowledge the hard work um, and leadership of the mighty young um, council person, Isaiah Thomas, for his work in, in addressing institutional systematic racism in the area um, of public safety. And so um, thank you, young man, for your hard work and all my colleagues for their hard work and dedication um, around this very, very important issue. Thank you very much, everyone. Congratulations, Councilmember Thomas. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I appreciate all of you so much.